Welcome everybody again to tonight's lesson. Uh, we're going to be talking more about the animals of the Bible. And uh, tonight we're going to look at a really kind of cool animal that is mentioned in the Bible. Anybody have a guess what we're going to look at tonight? What do you say? How did you know that? Well, <laughs> that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to look at the camel. So there you go, Brother Roddy's, uh, Roddy's on fire for it. He's a prophet tonight. We are going to look at the camel tonight. Now the camel is a really special animal and there's lots of really interesting th th things that we can find about the camel. The camel talked about all through the Bible, probably one of the most well talked about um, animals of the Bible, the sheep and goats and, and things like that. But we see the camel and in, in we look in Job and we see he had thousands and thousands of camels. So it's one thing that we see in the Bible is a sign of wealth. The more camels you had, the wealthier you were. It was also given as gifts we find uh, there in Genesis it was given as gifts and uh, where uh, Abraham gets gifts and, and then in chapter 32 we find uh, that Esau is given gifts of camels and various other things as well. So it's, a, it's something that is given as a gift. It's also used as transport many times in Genesis chapter 24. We find when um, Eleazar goes to, to find a wife and he finds Rebekah, he takes the camels and those are really important. Uh, because it's, it's where he goes to the well and he's looking for someone that's going to be a good wife um, for, for, um, for Isaac. And uh, he's, he prays that if uh, whoever comes, if they say, I'll draw for your camels also, then this is going to be somebody that is good. So there in Genesis chapter 24, we find how she drew the water. Now, when you took camels, can, we're going to look and see where the camels can drink a whole bunch of water. So it's a big deal for her to draw water for 10 camels out of a well. That's a lot of water that she's got to draw. So he knew that she was going to be a, a, a good wife if she was willing to do that uh, for, for a stranger. She had a good heart, right? We find it in, in uh, First Kings, we find in uh, Esther as well, that they sent out the messages by uh, camel and by dromedary as well. Okay, so what else do we find? We find in the scriptures, the Bible tells us that a camel is an unclean animal. Although it's used for many purposes, it is an unclean animal, so it is not to be eaten uh, here, according to the scriptures. And it says here in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 4, Nevertheless, these shall you not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof, as the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. Well, one of the reasons why the camel is unclean is because he, he, he stores all his water and he doesn't really sweat that much, so all his toxins are kept within his body. Same with the, the pig and stuff like that. So it doesn't really have, it's designed for a bird and it's designed to live in the desert. It's not, God never designed that to be eaten, although it is eaten and people do drink the milk as well. Now it is used in war, we find in the Bible, in First Samuel chapter 30, verse 17, we find it is used in war also. And so you think, well, you can look at a lot of military, use camels, the French used camels, the, you know, the Foreign Legion, uh, the Americans used camels, uh, and even the British forces when they were in Africa, in the Horn of Africa, they used camels as well, because they're, they're really, really good animals for doing these, these, uh, these types of things. So, what else do we find about the camel? The, camel, the word camel, and some of you probably know this, but the word camel comes from the Hebrew word gamal. And uh, through that, we get, we get to the Greek camelos, and then into English, we have camel. So it's one of those few words that sounds almost the same in Hebrew as it does in English. And the reason for that as well is we find that the Hebrew letter gimel, which is uh, the same, is, shows the hump. The old ancient, ancient letter shows the hump of a camel. That's what it represents. So gimel uh, and gimel, that's why it's... Uh, so when you see the word, see the, the letter gimel, you find that it oftentimes represents a camel or something rising up because this word is very, very similar. Which is really interesting because when we come to the Hebrew word for traveler or sojourner, we find it's the word gar. Now gar, if we look in ancient paleo, we see this is in modern Hebrew, but in ancient pictographic, we see that we've got a head and we've got a hump. Right? So we've got a man and a camel. So the Hebrew word for traveler is a man on a camel. 
I think that's really cool, you know, when we see these pictographic things. But anyway, so it shows us a man on a camel. Now, how many types of camel do you think there are today? Have a guess. What? Two, exactly. There are two types of camel today. There are basically two types of camel. Okay, the one type of camel here is the Bactrian camel, and it is the two-humped camel. So you have one hump or two, right? This is the, this is the double-humped camel, and he is a very hairy fella, you can see. Um, now, now what, what, what other kind of animals do you think are related closely to the camel? The llama as well. What else close related to the llama? The alpaca. Okay, so they're all part of that same family. You can see that here. And interesting enough, the, the llamas and alpacas share some of the same traits as the camel does. Okay, so we have that one, and there's another type of camel. Anybody guess what kind of uh, camel this is? So we've got the, the Bactrian camel, and we have a normal camel, indeed. Okay, it's called the Arabian camel or the dromedary camel. Okay, and this is the camel that we would most be familiar with, the one hump. So when you're going to get a camel, and he says, would you like a camel? You say, one hump or two, all right? And so this is the most common camel that we will find, the dromedary type camel. So these are the, these are the two here that you will be able to find, okay? And it just depends on what part of the world you are, to whether which camel you would get. Which one do you think is easier to ride? The one at the top. <laughs> I don't know. I've never ridden a camel, so I'm, I'm, I'm not... You kind of could sit between the humps, but you know it might it might be kind of painful. I don't know, I don't know, but uh, it does look like he's got. He does look a bit shorter legged as well. So here we have. Okay, so did you know the camel can live up to forty to fifty years? Right, that's a, a long lifespan for for an animal, and fully grown they stand over six foot tall. So that's up, you know, but here, six foot tall here, but that's uh, that's to his head. But to his, um, to his hump is over seven feet tall, all right? Seven feet tall at the hump. Now, they can sprint at a speed of up to 40 miles per hour, all right? So in a full gallop, he's, he's going at 40 miles an hour. That's, that's a fair whack. Now, he can't maintain that for very long. That's just for short periods of time. But what he can do is he can almost jog or canter at a steady 25 miles per hour. Hour. So that's that's it. and they can they can usually carry a person up to 100 miles a day. So by walking they can you know can carry it. and of course they can trot along for a bit like that. So it's a it's a it's a, a pretty a pretty um, a steadfast animal uh, animal in this. Now now we move on to the hump. Everybody knows about that's the one of the most distinguishing features about the camel is its hump. Now what do you think the hump is for? Storing water. No, it's not. Nope, it's not. Okay, so we'll move on to the next thing. No, 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 I'll tell you what it's for. The hump does not store water, but it stores fat. Okay, it stores fat. Now, what that fat does is the fat concentration helps minimize the insulating effect. Now, if you take something like a whale, a whale's got blubber, and it helps insulate it in the colder waters. Okay, same with, uh, with the bigger seals and things like that. They have blubber that helps insulate them. Well, if you're in the desert, fat all around you is not going to be very helpful because it's going to insulate you and it's going to make your body core temperature rise very high. So what the f camel does is it stores all its fat on its back. All right? Whereas humans store on our front, but the camel stores on the back. It might be better on your back because then you wouldn't be able to see it. You know? So he's, he's not worried about fat. No, me, I, you know, it's not there. So, you know. So it, the camel stores the fat, and then there's a big concentration of fat there, right? And that's for, 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 for when it starts to meta metabolize. Now, for every gram of fat that's metabolized, it produces a gram of water. So if you've got 100 grams of fat and you metabolize that, you get 100 grams of water. So it can then sustain for longer periods of time because as it metabolizes the fat, it produces water itself. So to say that it stores water is wrong, but it is for water production, but it also for other things, it's mainly to store fat because of the concentration there, so it doesn't have it on the rest of its body. So as it goes along, you'll see that camels, you'll see their humps will start to shrink and flop over. 
That's because they've metabolized all the fat. Now they've got to eat more and drink more, and they can build up their fat stores again, and then they can go for longer periods of time. So when you're on your camel and, and it starts to get a flat, you know, it's, t- it's time to start feeding your camel. Now what's really interesting about the camel is his blood. It's, uh, the camel's blood cells are actually oval. And the reason why they're oval is to lower the risk of the thickening of the blood when they're dehydrated. Now you think of our blood cells. Our blood cells are round. They're like a donut shape. Okay, same like with horses. But a camel's blood cells are like this. Okay, so they look like that. And they're, they're very elongated like this. All right? And if we look at something like a, a horse, all right, we look at a horse, there's horse's blood cells, and you can see they're quite roundish as well. All right? And the camel's blood cells are able to expand 240%, right, whereas most animals can only do 150%. So when they intake water, the camel's blood cells can swell. They can swell up, you know, almost two and a half times more than the size that they are, whereas the regular ones only swell up a little bit. So it can carry a lot more water in its bloodstream than other animals. Now, when you've got a round blood cell and you start to dehydrate, your veins and arteries also start to dehydrate as well and they start to shrivel. And that's what causes death because the blood can't pass through. So if you've got, if you've got an opening like this and you try to pass a, a round blood cell through, it's going to get stuck and the blood's going to thicken. Once it starts thickening, it's not going to be able to get through. Whereas if you've got a nice flat blood cell, and even though those, those, um, those um, vessels start to thin, that thin blood cell can go straight down because it follows the way of that. So even with this, with a camel, you can see as, as it starts to dehydrate, it can still pump blood very efficiently in the direction of flow because of the way the blood cells are designed. Now, you've got to think that, um, you know, when the camel had the, the round blood cells, as they were supposed to, the, the, as it said, when it evolved millions and millions of years ago, and it started to decide it didn't want to be a pig or a, a cow anymore, and it didn't want these red blood cells. You can just imagine this camel wandering through the desert, you know, and it starts to die because its, it's blood cells can't get through, and it's thinking, hey, you know, you need to make them more uh, oval shape. You know, how many camels were laying in the desert saying, get oval blood cells, get oval blood cells. No, of course they didn't. God designed them that way because he knew the kind of terrain that they were going to be in. You know, and this just gives more credibility to God's great design. Because something like that can't evolve. You know, how many humans have died from dehydration? How long have humans lived in the desert? But yet humans have never developed blood cells like that. Why? Because God didn't create us with blood cells like that. God created us with round blood cells in that way. Now, if we get too much blood, uh, water into our blood, our blood cells burst. Have you ever done that experiment? You can get the blood and you can add it to water and the blood cells start bursting because they they absorb the water and then they start bursting. So if you get too much water in your bloodstream, your blood vessels start bursting and then you'll die. You know, whereas a camel, they swell up in that way. What's that? Okay, so why does it retain water? Well, a camel can drink up about 200 liters of water in three minutes. That's an obscene amount of water in three minutes. That would be a great way to empty our baptistry. Just need us get us a camel, <laughs> you know. And within 10 minutes, 10 minutes, the water is gone from its stomach and it's processed and stored. Now, it stores that water around, around its stomach and other parts of the body and obviously in the bloodstream as well. And it can use that as it goes. And uh, camels can go for lengthy periods of time without a drop of water. They can go because they've absorbed this much. And that's why they can drink so much water. And they process it very quickly. So there's very little loss. And they also get water from eating green vegetation. So when they come across something green, they can eat that. Now, we also can get water from that. So can lizards and things. They can get water from it. Camels are very special that they can even get more water than we would. And they get every last piece of water out of everything that they, they eat. And they u- utilize it very, very well. Right? They even have tough, leathery mouths to be able to eat thorns. So they can kind of eat cactus, they can eat thorns, and it's all tough and leathery, so those thorns just don't poke through. So they can basically eat anything that they want to eat, and they'll get, be able to get the water out of those plants as well. <coughs> Now, this is the really, really cool thing about the camel. The camel has special nostrils. 
And as it exhales, and you know this, if you exhale on your glasses, your glasses will steam up. Why? Because there's water vapor there. Uh, the camel, when it exhales, the water vapor is trapped in its nostrils. And then that, they take that water and they reabsorb that water back into their body. So they're basically blowing, and when they blow out, is everything is dry. Whereas when we blow out, you know, if you blow on your hand for long enough, you'll start to feel it get wet because you've got the water vapor there. But a camel has nostrils that catch that water vapor and absorb it back into its system. Now that's a great design for something that's out in the desert. Very, very good at utilizing that. Okay, you can, you can stop blowing on your hand now. Okay. What else did they do? Well, the urine comes out as a very, very thick syrup. And although this is an unclean animal in the Bible, in Islam, they are permitted and encouraged to drink the camel urine. You say, you don't believe me? Well, there you go. There's a man out there catching, you know. You can just see them, you know, in most places say, oh, let's, let's go out for a drink. They say, let's, let's go out to the barn, you know. And they do. They, they go out and they, clutch the, they collect the camel's urine and they drink it you know, without ice. You know, straight from the, you know. Uh, Muhammad actually recommended that they do this. But it was, as a result, it's been promotion of, of SARS and MRSA and, and lots of other diseases from drinking that. So I don't advise you to drink any form of urine, especially not camel urine. Okay. So the feces of a camel are not eaten, just so you know. <laughs> But the feces come out, they're so dry that the Bedouins and things like that, the people that, that, that keep the camels, they can take that feces, that poop, and they can burn it straight away. Because, I mean, for, for years and years and years, even in Scotland, people used to use animal poo as fuel. Um, you know, my grandmother used to go out and they'd turn the cow pats over and let them dry. And when they were dry, they used to stack them up and they would use those to burn. Uh, they would use that as a free fuel as they use every part of it. Well, the camel is much the same. They can use that, that for, but, it, but because it, it, the kidneys and the liver and everything like that is so good at filtering the water, when the poop comes out, it's so dry that they can basically pick it up and use it as fuel. It just, there's no water whatsoever in the, so I mean, whereas you compare it to elephant poo, you can take up elephant poo and squeeze it if you want to, and there's all water that comes out of it. Now, my name's not Bear Grylls, so I'm not going to be doing that anytime qu that quickly, okay? But um, it just goes to show you the difference on how much water is, is, is lost in feces. But the camel is able to, to retain all that water. And it's phenomenal that they're able to do these things. Now, the, the camel has to regulate his temperature. And what he does is he sweats at skin level, right at the skin, rather than at the edge of his... his um, his fur, he sweats right at the skin level, so it keeps it close to the skin. And so it's not, he's not sweating by the ambient heat around. He's sweating by his own body heat, okay, which helps keep him cool. And they can lose up to 25% of their body weight this way. Whereas most animals, if they lost within 12 to 14%, they would be at real risk of heart failure or cardiac arrest. So, so the camel can lose a, almost a quarter of his body weight by sweat and still be okay. That's phenomenal for a camel, for an, any animal to be able to do that. And their thick coat, you would wonder, say, well, a thick coat in the desert, that's a bit weird. But the thick coat actually helps preserve them and stops them sweating. If you shear a camel, it will sweat. It has to sweat 50% more to keep itself cool, all right, to stop itself from overheating. So that thick coat is there and it stops the sweating. Now even in the summer, the coat starts to become lighter, obviously to reflect more sunlight uh, and these things. Now, why this is why like Elijah and especially John the Baptist wore a camel's hair coat. Why? Because out in the desert, it was great. It, it was insulating. It kept, it kept him warm and it also kept him cool. It's a phenomenal thing. Even the sackcloth that they talk about, the sackcloth and ashes, we find was probably um, from camel's hair as well. Not camel skin, but camel's hair. And it's very, very, very good at doing this. So not only is it good for, um, for traveling and things like that, it's also good for clothing. Now the camel's body temperature, it can range from 34 degrees to 40 degrees over the period of a day. 
Now, whereas a human being, if, you, if your body temperature rises by just a few degrees, you can be in danger of hyper, uh, hyperthermia or hypothermia. Right? You, can, you can overheat or you can cool off. You can be in real danger of that. You can get a high fever or you can get hypothermia. Whereas a camel can, can, can um, change over the course of the day from 34 degrees in the morning to 40 degrees before it starts to cool off for the night. Now, that's, that's a big temperature difference for core temperature. Right? But they have a special blood vessel system around their brains that helps maintain the temperature of the brain. So the brain can stay a constant temperature even though the body is, is, is fluctuating through the day. They've got a special blood vessel system in place that helps to transfer things and heat and it can keep the brain at a special temperature so that it doesn't, the brain doesn't fry even though the body temperature. Now God's obviously given the, the camel as well longer legs to help keep the body away from the hot ground. Because if he had wee tiny legs, he's going to get hot really quickly. Also, he wouldn't be able to walk as far. So God has powerfully designed the camel, and it's designed to do what it does do, and what it does do, it does do well. Amen. And um, so it's got this in this way. So with the blood vessel system and all these things, it's able to keep itself quite regulated in the temperature so it doesn't overheat. And you say, well, what about when it starts to lay down? I've seen camels laying down. What happens when the camel lays down? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. You did want to know that question. You did have that question. Well, there we're going to tell you. The camel has a massive tissue over its sternum. The sternum is here, what we call your, 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 your breastbone here, your sternum. Okay, and it's called the pedestal. And it's a big fatty layer. Right? And I'll bring up a picture here. Now you can see it just under here. You see this fatty bit here? Right? Show you. It's called the pedestal there. And what it does is it allows it to lay down in the hot ground without discomfort. Right? So when he lays down like that, you can see that that fatty mass would stop his internal organs from getting hot on the sand. So it's like having a big piece of thick of skin, big thick piece of skin. Now, if you've ever been to the beach and the beach sand is really, really hot, and you lay on the beach, you're like, oh, it's really hot. But you put a blanket down and it isn't. So this pedestal here is much like that blanket to help absorb the heat. Now, you can see the way he's laying. And you can see here's a better picture of the pedestal up here, see underneath him. And you can also see in his knees and his, if you like his elbows, they also have pads here. And uh, that also absorbs that to be able to, to lay down on the hot sand and not have a, have a bother. So God has given it perfect design and put perfect things just where it lays down as well. But this pad here is so perfectly designed. How does something like that evolve? How does something like that decide, hey, I get really hot when I lie down. I need to evolve a big fatty mass over my sternum that can stop me getting hot. Because it's not over the rest of the body. It's just there. So it stops his internal organs from getting too hot. So phenomenal things that we can learn about the creature. And we have to say, how did something like this evolve? You know, if it, if it evolved, how did it evolve? The answer is it didn't. There's no way evolution has the answers to any of these things. Even the camel's hoofs are specially designed to where it actually, you could, a camel could walk past you taking a nap and you wouldn't even know it was there. It's so silent. The pads absorb everything. It can just walk past you and you wouldn't even know that the camel had gone past you until you start drinking its pee. Um, you wouldn't even know. It's perfectly designed in that way. Now, what about camels in the scripture? Well, the most famous, I think, you would, you would figure for the camel is in Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus says unto his disciples here in, in tw verse 23, Verily I say unto you, the rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All right? So what he's saying here, we find here it says that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Okay? So we see these two things and we understand that it's very hard for, for someone that's trusting in riches to even make a profession, let alone actually get saved. Now we, we, we kind of think of this. No, <laughs> it's a uh, that's kind of the, the image that we have. A very, very big needle or a very tiny, very tiny camel. But we also find, people have said in the scripture, they said, well, wait a minute. 
what Jesus was talking about was a little gate called the eye of a needle. And to get your camel through that, you had to unload it and have it get down on his knees and put this. Now, that's, you know, there is a gate there, and there is one, something called the eye of the needle. Unfortunately, it was only there in the 16th century. And so Jesus couldn't have possibly been talking about that. He was literally talking about a camel going through the eye of a needle. Because people that trust in riches are trusting in a false god. They're trusting in a god that is not the god of the Bible. And so when we see that, we see that Jesus said, with men this is impossible, with God all things are possible. He said, it's possible for God to get a camel through the eye of a needle? Of course it is. With God all things are are possible. So it it means that people can be saved that trust in riches. It's just going to be very, very difficult. Because why? Everything that they have is their God. They're trusting in what their God is. They're not trusting in the true and living God. It's almost like evolution. They're trusting in something that is logical, something that's tangible. But to trust in God is something that to a lot of people is illogical. But when we look in the scriptures, we see it. it, It's the pinnacle of all logic. The pinnacle of wisdom is God. Now, we also see other passages passages in the Bible. In Mark chapter 10, it says much the same. Verse 25, in Luke 18, 25, also says, It's easier for a camel to go through the needles, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into uh, the kingdom of God. So he's telling us it's very, very hard for rich people, people are trusting riches, to get saved. Why? Because they think they have it. What do, what do they need? What do they lack? What do they lack? You know, what do they lack? Because everything they have, if something breaks down, they pay the money. If they need a bill, they pay money. They have no faith in God. Because they have no need of anything. So it's very difficult for them to step out by faith and believe something like by faith. Just like evolution. And evolutionists would want to come and say, oh, this camel evolved this and evolved that and evolved this, everything like that. Rather than my faith saying, you know what? God created this. God created this, although we weren't there when he created it. He created it, but he took all those little details. A cow doesn't have a pedestal. A cow doesn't have um, oval blood vessels. Cow doesn't need these things. You know, just like a camel doesn't have horns. It's not needed. Did you know that a camel can actually scare a horse? Horses are scared of camels. And so the uh, troops would use camels uh, against cavalry because the horses were scared of the camels. Oh, good man. I'm kind of scared of camels <laughs> when you look at them. You know, when they're spitting and making noises, it's not something that you want to, um, want to come across. If you anger a camel, you know... <laughs> You know, same with the llamas and things like that. No, I'm not really scared. Of them. But it's, they're, they can be scary beasts, but they can scare a horse. Now, what else do we find in the scriptures that talks about camel? Well, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23 and, ver- and verse 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other, other undone. Ye blind guides, which strainer than that, and swallow a camel. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, some of the Pharisees would even pour their wine through strainers, just in case they accidentally swallowed a fly. You know, because if you swallow a fly, you get to swallow a spider. You know, and, and then it goes on and on and on and on. But they would they would pour their wine through these meshes so that just in case that they they would strain. That's what he's talking about straining a gnat. But because they were doing that, they were missing all these other weightier matters, all the more important things about love and grace and truth. They were missing all these things. So they were basically swallowing the camel. They were they're swallowing this camel, even though they were straining at something very small. Even though something so very insignificant about that. You know, I mean, sometimes you're riding along and a fly gets in your mouth. What are you going to do about it? You know, but to, you know, you kind of just, you kind of move on. But the bigger things of the of the law, the bigger things that really matter, are loving your neighbor as yourself, loving God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your mind. About sharing the gospel, people today are even uh, too consumed in little gnat things. They're straining out gnats, but in turn, they're swallowing cows. They're missing the point. They're 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 getting sidetracked. So many of the devils do that. And they're straining the gnats, but all the time they're swallowing camels and they're swallowing these things, rejecting truth and uh, accepting lies. So it's just for us to realize that although this camel is a, a great, great creature, it's something to think about that we don't swallow the camel. 
and we don't strain at the neck, that we, we don't do either, that we look and we see what is truly important. You know, if you could ask the camel, say, what is important? He would say, water. Even though you can go for a long period of time without water, he'd say, well, I still need water. But God has made me to be able to do these things. He needs the pad. He needs his, his legs. He needs his coat. All these things God has put in place. And if we take any of those things away from the camel, he has great difficulties. Just like when we take things away from the word of God and we start to add in other things, it becomes problematic. You know, if we take away faith and we add riches, you know, we're going to have problems. If we start to take out things out of the Bible, we start to nitpick about some little tiny things that are insignificant, like red songbooks or blue songbooks, and people argue about that. But we, t we get away from something that God says an abomination. You know, We're too busy arguing about who's, who's got the better songbook or who's got the nicer pews rather than things that God says are an abomination or things that make God very disappointed, when things that make God sad. You know, the festivals and things that people do today uh, and all of these things that, make, that grieve God and grieve the Holy Spirit. People don't see those things, but they want to argue over who's got the better pews, who's got the better songbooks, who's got the nicer building, you know, who's whiter than white. But we need to get back to the scriptures and see. We can't take out one bit. We can't. We've got to have it all or nothing. All or nothing. Just like that camel. He's got to have all his parts in place for him to be able to survive. And just like that, we need the Bible. We need all our parts in place for us to be survived as Christians. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, Lord, we thank you for the camel. We thank you for creating it. Thank you for the study there. And thank you for these marvelous facts we learned about the camel. We pray that we'd be able to share this with others. That they might hear and understand and realize that you are the creator of all things. And that, uh, Lord, you have created some amazing things. But most importantly, Lord, help us to remember not to remove or to add to your word, uh, but take it all as the word of God. And we know that it's all profitable and it's all good for us, Lord. And help us to apply it to our lives day by day. We thank you, Lord. We love you. And we pray this in Jesus' most precious name for his sake.